Welcome everyone to uh, Cyber Sangha, this wonderful space, the brainchild of uh, Tenzin Wanja Rinpoche. And um, this space, we, you know, free teachings and dialogues and um, I'm delighted to be the host today. My name is Alejandro Chaul uh, of this dialogue about anxiety, a very important topic. This cycle, this uh, year, we, we're doing all different, um, and different aspects of emotions that might take us out of who we want to connect with inside, kind of what Rinpoche many times calls our pain identities. And, um, and today we're going to touch on anxiety. On breaking the cycle of anxiety and finding calm within the storm. And we have two wonderful speakers uh, joining us, uh, joining Rinpoche in this dialogue. And one of them is my colleague, Anne Friedman. And um, Anne is a PhD in psychology. Um, and um, she, as she will tell us, she experienced anxiety and through that found mindfulness. And uh, now she's a mindfulness teacher and she's done great work in this area, um, both in her training as well as applica uh, applying it to different areas, to different schools, to corporations, and uh, all these aspects of um, bringing what she's learned into her uh, job, actually. So it's been amazing, amazing to see that. And Judd, um, Many know Judd from his research at Brown University, um, and specifically on this topic, he has done research on mindfulness, on anxiety, and his last book is called Unwinding Anxiety, so uh, perfect uh, for this topic. And of course, uh, Rinpoche doesn't want me to introduce him much, but I'll say a few words of Rinpoche uh, being uh, born uh, in India in a Tibetan family, studying in the Tibetan, in a Tibetan context in a monastery with his great teacher, Lopo Ntenzi and, uh, and then coming to the West and bringing these teachings and finding ways of bringing them in a way that makes sense to us. Um, and I found in the 30 years that I've been studying with him that he has been studying us. And as he studies us, he says, how can these teachings be applicable for the Western mind or for the human mind uh, for that uh, and the human heart? So thank you all for being here for, for this uh, dialogue. I wanted to start with Anne and particularly because in this cycle that we're doing, uh, people are really interested in, in, in how the experience of these different, last time we spoke about depression and we had Juanita Rasmus and, and we had Norman Farb. And um, so today with anxiety, I wanted to start with you, Anne, and, and I know you've shared this story before and it's so powerful that if you can share it with this audience. I'd be delighted to, thanks, Ale. Um, so I uh, was from a high functioning family, very, a lot of expectations of myself growing up. Um, and, but I never imagined that I would have panic attacks. So I actually was a psychologist, still am. I trained at the University of Houston um, did my uh, internship at UT Health Science Center and my postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine. So very good training. And I was teaching in the graduate program at the University of Houston when our house flooded and we had to move to an apartment and my mother started having brain seizures. I had a bad health checkup. My husband was switching jobs. It was thing after thing after thing. And I wasn't handling it well and ended up having panic attacks. And my husband was said to me, honey, what the heck is happening to you? I've never seen you like this. And I said, I'm having panic attacks. And he said, you're a psychologist, do something. And I was totally humbled. Here it is, a mental health worker having a mental disorder. 
brought me to my knees. I had two major attacks in 2006. And I am so grateful for that experience because it helped me find mindfulness and it changed my life. <laughs> um, that spring, I saw a, um, an advertisement about a uh, mindfulness retreat, a Jewish mindfulness retreat, and I'm Jewish. And, um, and the teacher, I went to it, and the teacher had studied Zen in Japan. He'd also studied Sufi meditation, wide, a wide breadth of knowledge, Jewish meditation. But we did the traditional meditating 45 minutes beginning at 5.30 in the morning of uh, sitting, walking, sitting, breakfast, sitting, walking, sitting, <laughs> lunch. And I thought, oh my gosh, I studied the brain for seven years and I am clueless about the brain. When I watched my own, I had been in therapy, but never sat and watched this wily critter up here <laughs> and how tricky it can be. And it was a true learning experience that took me several days to coming out of my skin, feeling like I can't do this before I began to settle and realized I'd found the path. So I worked with this teacher for many, many years until unfortunately he has passed away and I now have a new teacher that I continue to work with and I will always have a teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> Judd, I know that You've done research in this area, and uh, I wanted to ask you before that: um, Do you do you have any personal experiences that you want to share too that brought you to this kind of research? <laughs> sure, I can certainly I'm nodding my head listening to, listening to Anne's story. So I actually didn't know that I had a lot of anxiety at the end of college when I was starting medical school, um, but just you know figured I was stressed out and this and that and. It started meditating as part of medical school and found it very, very helpful uh, for my own life. And similar in medical school, we didn't we didn't learn a whole lot about the mind. We certainly learned about neurons and synapses and neurotransmitters and things like that, but not really anything about how the mind works. I shouldn't say not that much. And then during residency, when I was in my psychiatry residency, I started getting panic attacks myself. <laughs> so, you know, the the nice thing was that. I'd been practicing 10 or more years at that point. And so my practice kicked in. And I, in, at that time, I was, I was using a, a Southeast Asian practice called noting practice that was popularized by Mahasi Saito. And I, it really helped me be able to notice the, all of the, all of the very unpleasant aspects of a panic attack, but be less identified with them. And, you know, basically, uh, you know, woke up in the middle of the night with my first panic attack, uh, was in a habit of kind of noting my experience, like, oh, there's a thought, there's that sensation, there's this, there's this. And then uh, at, when it finished, I went, my mind, I was in training, was like, oh, check, 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 check. I just had a panic attack, you know, because I'd been learning the criteria. And then I went back to sleep, probably in a sleep deprived state from being in residency. And so after several more of those, just really, uh, and I like how you said that, Anne, you know, just bowing to this as a teacher, was really grateful to see that I could have full-blown panic attacks and not get caught up into them into the point where I would develop panic disorder, where I started worrying about future panic attacks. And also really appreciated the power of these practices where, you know, this, you know, if if I can write out a full blown panic attack with some with some mindfulness practice, wow, you know. So the other thing I'll mention is that in residency and medical school, I never learned that anxiety could actually be driven like a habit. And my lab had been studying habit change and habit formation. We'd done work with smoking and with overeating and things like that, and using mindfulness training to help with these. But somebody in one of our we had this app called Eat Right Now, and somebody in that in that program said, Hey, could you develop a program for anxiety? Because I'm stuck in this loop where anxiety is triggering me to eat and I can't get out of it. 
and this was this went back to you know these these core foundational elements mm -hmm. of, of Buddhism, like dependent origination. We'd even published some papers suggesting that that was the first mention of what we now think of as positive and negative reinforcement. So these psychological things that we learn in in college, even in, in high school, high college, grad school, you know, people getting Eric Kendall got the Nobel Prize showing that this is evolutionarily conserved back to the sea slug. Yet this was all described um, beautifully uh, by, you know, the, the Buddhist theories. And here, you know, not only could I apply them myself when I was having a panic attack, but also start to, we developed a program called Unwinding Anxiety, where we could test to see if these worked. And long story short, we got a 67% reduction in anxiety, 67% um, reduction in anxiety in people with generalized anxiety disorder in a randomized controlled trial that uh, that we now published a couple of years ago. And that really, and then we replicated the, the study with people who are having sleep disturbances, et cetera. And so found a pretty strong effect where the, the bottom line is if we, if we can learn how our minds work, we can learn to work with our minds and also learn to put our minds to work for us uh, to help us work with, you know, really challenging things like anxiety and panic attacks. So it's been really helpful for me clinically as well, because, you know, the, the best medications out there, uh, the number needed to treat is 5.2, meaning about one in five of my patients is going to show a significant reduction in symptoms with the best medications. In our studies, we found that number needed to treat, that's the official term for it, was 1.6. So, you know, uh, a bit more a bit more likely that somebody's going to benefit than, than with medication, which is really promising that we can we can put our minds to work for us. So, yeah, it's it's been a fascinating journey. Thank you, thank you, Judd. Rinpoche, many times you you tell us students that you know when we have something like anxiety or anger, any any ask you said, where do you go? Do you go to your you know to your medicine or do you go to your practice? Right, and uh, you trained in in a monastery. Can you tell us a little bit how? these things were dealt with if they came up, if they were talked about. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here. So in the monastery, when we are trained, learning, meditating, we, we don't, we have never talked about anxiety to start with. So I, the anxiety word is a new forward for me as I'm coming in the West. So in the monastery, we, we never talked about it. Um, so what I think in generally in the teachings, they talk about it is you see, it's a mind, you know, you have a mind and you have a body and then you have a breath. So anxiety manifestation of anxiety, I think in some sense, I think it's the mind, breath and the body. So if you think about the mind, think about small self and a big self. So you have two self that which can uh, be cause or condition of anxiety. So if it's a big self, then there's no anxiety. Big self, the, the who you are, have no reason to get any anxious about it because it, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't lose anything. It always sees itself as full, perfect, complete. So it always comes down to the idea of the small self. And then the question is, your small self is how small it is. The smaller it is, the more anxiety you will feel. The greater you can make it, the less anxiety you will feel. So this question about journey from small self to big self is a big journey. Or ability to reflect within the small self, saying, for example, or oh, whatever you are worried about, anxious about, as a, you know, you can think about that as a, you know, or you know, maybe this is not a reason to worry, you know, maybe this is not that bad. Maybe I, I, I actually I'm not able to see how good things are. So you, you reflecting from the openness to see the same situation, what you makes you anxious can make you actually smile, laugh, love, uh, feel peace. You can change the actual experiences of that situation with the perspective <laughs> of shift. So that perspective of shit is where more sense of reflection, small self is helped by reflecting by little bigger self is helping the small self to say, come on, 
you know, you don't look at that. Well, this is this is good. This is not bad. So that dialogue goes in ourselves, right? So I think so. There's a there's a two main journey, and then of course, in terms of the breath, I think breath plays a very important role. So, and it comes down to I think what Jad was saying, and you know, idea, interesting the idea of as ends. I think she she you said also about many people who feel a panic attack. One of the things what happens to them frequently, they're worried about it happening again. So since it happened one time, you identify with it. And that identity is afraid of it's happening again. So, but you don't, usually we think about what will happen to me. We don't think about who is happening to. We ignore that part. So that's the key in the practice is the key. Who is happening to? Can I change that person? Rather than what's happening to me, can I change the experience? But if you if you address it properly, then then you clearly look. Someone is afraid of it to, to it to happen again. Just simply being aware of that, I think it really helps a lot. And then another thing I think what Jed said was interesting. It's a habit building a habit of anxiety. So, so once again, if you if you are frequently anxious, you identify with it. I am the anxious person. You know, I'm not. I'm different from you. I get anxious, and it's normal for me. And I'm ready to get another one soon. Just if you don't shut up or whatever, whatever. If you don't, you're not trying to be kind to me. I'm ready to get another time anxious. So that identification, I think, always continuously play a very, very important role in in anxiety. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you. So uh, either Anne or Jad, uh, if you want to talk about this aspect of identification and what Rinpoche brought about the breath. Uh, I know we talk a lot about the mind and thinking of, you know, how how neuroscience can look at the mind, but the breath seems to be crucial here. So if any of you want to talk about that. Well, Yes, I, I guess for me, I didn't understand when my mother used to tell me when I was a little girl and I was nervous about giving a class report, take some long, slow, deep breaths, that she was telling me science. And that, in fact, we can activate the parasympathetic nervous system of rest and digest through the breath, which, you know, I now practice regularly. Um, so the breath has been very, very important to me anytime I feel at all tense, but what has been equally as important for me was sitting and watching the ways that my mind attempts to construct and predict, which I knew through cognitive behavioral therapy that many people did, but I didn't realize the extent that all people do, including me <laughs> until I sat and watched the way my mind would try to jump to answers, try to make assumptions about things that were completely wrong over and over again. So the key practice for me from the get-go was, can you know it's true and backing off of it? Um, and then learning a lot of equanimity and compassion. So it's been a combination of practices that have really, really helped me. I've never had another panic attack since 2006. <laughs> yeah yeah and i'll just add the you know this aspect of the habit of self where you know we we can be I, there was somebody an early pilot tester of our unwinding anxiety program who sent me an email saying i feel like this is deeply etched in my bones you know this deep etch you know and, and was asking how do i how do i work with this because they were so identified with their anxiety and so this you know when we when we feel anxious and we start to worry and then we think yep that's who i am then it just it just feeds this vicious cycle and then we feel like this is all i am and it will you know often you know, a lot of anxiety is about the future and we start thinking into the future oh no and this is the way it's always going to be which just causes more suffering in the moment. And the irony is that in the moment, that's the opportunity to step out of these cycles. Yeah, so, I, I, it's a, <clears throat> like for example, when people feel anxious, um, so you can notice that in your breath, 
Uh, you can also notice that in your facial expression, so like you will be feeling very uh, down and, uh, and you don't have to look at the mirror. You can, if you observe your face, facial muscles expression, you can already feel that you are anxious. Yeah. And uh, the moment, if you, it's hard to change talking about the big self or even small self or different kind of small self or self-reflection on all these might be difficult for someone to do it because people who don't know about these, these knowledge and meditation and all of that. But at least if they observe that, their face, they say, I mean, just, just shifting their muscles in their face, they know how does the smile look like. How does the sadness look like? They can shift the muscle even they have not changed the cause, primary cause of the mind. They have not even changed the small self, big self, the breath, but even changing the muscle. You're telling to the anxiety, I know you are here. Mm -hmm. The communication takes place this moment you shift the muscles of the face. I think that really, really helps a lot. It's a very simple thing. Maybe even some point, maybe even silly thing to do in the middle of the night. You're smiling in your bed in the dark room by yourself. <laughs> But but that might change your sleep, absolutely. You know. Thank you, Rinpoche. So so yeah, Anne and Judd, what what are uh, signs for you? Is it the face? Is it you know that you notice and that you can shift now that you know that you have these practices? You know what 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 happens? What can you share with the audience that is going through things like that that they can notice? Oh, this is happening to me, and this is what I can do. So for me, um, it is noticing if my mind returns often to the same topic. So if, if I'm not focused in the moment and my mind's drifting and it keeps going off with a repetitive topic, that means that I've got a strong emotion going on. And for me, that's stop. I've got to stop, take a breath, observe what is going on with me. What is my mind believing? Um, you know, and then, you know, do some practices to equanimity, compassion, to let go. And um, it's been a game changer. And I will notice it with the smallest of things, even just shoulders getting tight, right? Through the body, I can feel something's not quite right here. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like I call it the Pac-Man that is just gnawing at you to turn around, pay attention to me this feeling, right? Look at me. And as soon as we do, you know, we can, we can calm it, you know, in ways it's miraculous. I wished I'd known the practice when I had the panic attacks in 2006, John, that would have helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll just uh, make a little co uh, comment on Anne. So uh, like as Anne saying that, you know, the kind of watching yourself, and very interesting that you are you going back to the same topic again and again, right? You you don't want to think about it, you don't want to feel about it, and you're trying to take some breathing, deep breathing that you have learned, and then suddenly, before even they just finish the breathing, you're back to the topic, mm -hmm. and you even forgot you started to do a meditation on a breathing. <laughs> so so what happens? I think that the really interesting point is there. It's you cannot change action unless you change the one who is acting. I say, you know, in order to get rid of, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to get rid of alcohol, but it's harder to get of, get rid of alcoholic person. So the person, if, 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 not, if, if there's not any change shift in the per person, the person will always find it the alcohol, right? It's, so if person does not need it, alcohol even can be there, doesn't make difference. So I think this sense of really addressing uh, who, who is feeling, right? I mean, then, uh, as I said earlier, question about big self, who, if there is somebody who has that knowledge, I think greatest, greatest method for sure. And who does not have that knowledge, then there's question about a small self, who, who is afraid? I'm of somebody's, my fear is very feeling anxiety. Why my fear is feeling very anxiety? Because I'm feeling I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to, whatever it is. Then you look from a little bit more bigger perspective of the same situation. 
you feel you don't have to worry about it. Maybe you feel even you, if you lose this job, this will be fine. I will be fine. Maybe you can say, I don't care. I, I lose a job. You feel more confidence. I'll, I'll find a better job. Well, you keep on building more confidence in no matter what situation is. And those shift in person's identity, that actually then will not repeat the same story again. Mm -hmm. Because you can, you can force yourself to not pay attention to that. But if nothing changes the person, it's going to repeat again and again for sure. Thank yeah. you. Judd, you said something before that reminds me of this. And um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact words, but this feeling that sometimes anxiety is all of my being, all of my person, right? The, almost like if I want to, if I'm going to use Rinpoche's words, kind of my big self is now all full of anxiety. And um, can I, you know, can I re-identify that this is not me, that it's actually just a small self that is the anxiety, and I still have this bigger self. Is that something that it's part of unwinding anxiety? Is that part of your experience, if you can share any of that? Yes. So one of the aspects of helping, you know, and this even lines up with some of the neuroscience research that my lab had done over 10 years ago now with, with experienced meditators, looking at where we found there's a network of brain regions called the default mode network, which is ironically what we default to when we're not doing anything else. And that default mode network is self-referential. So we tend to default to thinking about ourselves. Often that's regretting things we've done in the past, worrying about the future. And both of those activities have been shown to activate the, the default mode network. And what we found was experienced meditators actually deactivate that default mode network during meditation and even have what seem to be altered uh, connectivity. They don't talk to other regions of the brain in the same way that, that non-meditators do. What, that, what we've subsequently found is that that seems to line up with this feeling of like this closed down, contracted, experience so when we're anxious we feel you know it, people tend to report feeling closed down or contracted you know that pac-man is gnawing at us it doesn't make us feel open and expanded and when we're when we're meditating or also when we're being mindful in the moment i think of it as is really when we're simply being curious when we're curious we open to our experience and that also deactivates the default network and so one pragmatic aspect that, that that we found and we use in our in our unrunning anxiety program uh, is is really about helping people awaken their natural capacity to be curious. And one simple way to do that is to notice. So remember, say you mentioned the the face. You know, there's that the term in science they they call the somatic memory, where when we when we have a certain facial expression that that can be associated with emotions. And so we can even make that facial expression, it can elicit that emotion. Or when there's an emotion, it elicits that facial expression. And as you demonstrated <laughs> your facial expression, when we tend to be anxious, our eyes tend to be narrowed or closed down. And when we're curious, they tend to be open. Oh, what's going on? So I have people pay attention to that, that tone of voice that's going on you know, behind the scenes where it's like, oh no, when we're worrying, it's like, oh no. And maybe our eyes are narrowed. Maybe our face is showing that we're we're anxious. Oh no! As we're worrying, and then we can go, oh, I'm worrying, and we can get curious about what that worry feels like in the body. And what that does is that curiosity opens us to see these phenomena, these sensations, these emotions, these thoughts that are just coming and going, and that helps us tap into the less identified aspect of experience. So when we're, when it's, oh no, it's all about me, that small self. Oh no, what's going to happen? Is this always going to be this way? Is this ever going to change? All those things where we can go, oh, that's a thought. Who owns a thought? <laughs> you know, oh, it's a thought. It's coming. And it's often, you know, by the time we go looking for it, it's gone. And there's another thought. There's another thought. So we can start to identify those habit loops. And when we, the, we do this pragmatically is we have people map out these habit loops. Like, you know, what's the trigger? The behavior tends to be worrying or distracting oneself or doing something as a way to avoid the feeling of anxiety. And then what's the result of it? You know, often when we worry, we just get more anxious. So just being able to map out the process, we can see this as an impersonal thing that's happening. Our brain just happens to get stuck in this habit loop. 
you know, and ironically, it's a survival mechanism that's not helping us survive because anxiety is not helpful for survival. And once we can recognize those habit loops and recognize the thoughts and recognize the behavior of worrying, that helps us be less identified with it so that it's easier to step out of it and into that large, you know, the, the larger self or the, the non-self aspect of experience. Yeah, maybe just uh, <clears throat> as Jad saying about, you know, ah, it's the idea of curiosity. So, so there's a two things happening, right? One, you're having experiences of anxiety in your uh, body, in experiences of anxiety in, in your emotions. So the emotions and thoughts, but, but then there is uh, someone there who is saying, ah, I'm curious, I'm curious. The one who I'm curious is different than the one who is feeling anxious. It's mm -hmm. one little level has shifted up. It's not still the big self, but little mini baby step toward bigger self than the self which is feeling identifying with anxiety. That shift, I think, is a so important, critical thing uh, to address and talk and trying to work with that rather than, than getting caught up too much with experiences of anxiety itself. Because anxiety experiences will be, it can shift very fast when that shifts. If when that doesn't shift, no matter what you're trying to teach yourself, tell yourself, and do different kind of fancy meditation. But the same person who is who is anxious is doing the relaxing meditation doesn't work. Someone a little bit, another one has to do the relaxing meditation so that then it will work, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And so the practice that I most often use, which I know you all know, is the RAIN practice. Uh, where we recognize the emotion, label it. And usually there's a mix of emotions, right? It's not just a single emotion. Find and then identify the strongest of those. But I think, Judd, I'm not a neuroscientist, but that I did do a, a postdoc in, in uh, neuropsychology, that actually our brains calm when we just recognize anxieties here and just label it, right? There's, there's some science around this. And then um, in addition to that, we move from there into full acceptance that we can be with this, that it's just an experience, like a thought, like a rain on our head, just something happening in this moment that's passing through that we, you know, we can just be with. And then investigating that curiosity that Judd was talking about, investigating, oh, how is this manifesting? What does it look like in my body? Can I breathe with it? Noticing that you know sensations are shifting and changing, and then again bringing the equanimity and compassion, which I has, have found to be the key for me. But um, it just it just all of a sudden it transforms. It transforms. Thank you. So. This aspect of transformation or breaking the cycle, and I know, Anne, you mentioned in passing this stop, like the stop formula, right, that many probably in the audience know of stop and kind of disengage from the fight or flight response and take a deep breath and be open and just notice. And then when you're ready, you proceed, but maybe it takes a few breaths. Um, this is one way of breaking the cycle. We've had, you know, with the sensations of noticing in the face, as Rinpoche was saying, I want to come back to, to the breath. Are there particular uh, breathings um, that, you know, and I know there's so many, right, in the practices, whether it's in mindfulness and yoga and different kinds of meditation and Tai Chi, there's so many breathings, but are there things that, that you use? That that are your go-to practices. You mentioned rain. Other other things that more related maybe with breath or with movement. Well, certainly. Go one, oh, go go ahead, please. No, go ahead, Jess. I was going to say one of my favorites is something that I learned from somebody who uses mindfulness training with children. Uh, it's called five finger breathing, where mm -hmm. I'm sure many folks are familiar with this, where 
you know, as we breathe in, we trace up the outside of one of our fingers. As we breathe out, we trace down the inside, you know, and as we breathe in, we trace up. And so you can imagine over the course of five breaths, we've traced our, our hand, 10 breaths we've traced back. And the one thing I like about that is it lines up with some of the, the neuroscientific theories around working memory, where we don't have a lot of space in our, the part of the brain, the network. I mean, it's, it's not as simple as just a part of the brain, but there's a, there's a brain region associated a lot with working memory called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And working memory seems to, we meet, seem to be able to hold only a few pieces of information at one time. You know, imagine trying to remember, you know, four or five pieces of information before you know, going to the grocery store or something like that. It's hard to remember much more than that. And so if that's true, then if we're paying attention to two aspects of physical, three aspects of physical sensation, so the physical sensation of the breath, physical sensation on one finger and the physical sensation on another finger, that's three things. And then we're paying attention to looking at our hand, that's four. We can basically reboot our working memory processes by simply paying attention to the breath as we're doing this five finger breathing process. And as part of that, you know, it kind of reboots. And we might notice that, you know, the physiology, we tend to calm down a little bit just by doing those five mindful breaths. So when those thoughts come back online, if we have worry thoughts, you know, they're, they're like, oh, you should be worried. And our body's saying, oh, I'm not really feeling it. <laughs> and there's a mismatch where they have to, to, they have to kind of be attuned to each other. So if we're thinking anxious thoughts and we're feeling anxious feelings, they tend to feed off of each other. But if we're thinking anxious thoughts and we're not really feeling it, it's much easier to just notice, those, oh, there's a thought and just let it come and go as compared to kind of getting caught up in it or being identified with it. So I'm a big fan of the five finger breathing uh, because it's, you know, whether we understand the neuroscience or not, it's, it's very pragmatically helpful for people. And especially for people that have children, if the, you know, if they as parents are feeling anxious, their kids want to come and help them. They can tell that their parents are anxious so they can teach this to their kids. And then their kids can come and help and say, hey, let's do some five finger breathing together. And then they, they get to help their parent calm down, which is really empowering for their for their child at the same time. So five finger breathing, are you is it like a five or is it like a different uh, the length uh, how how deep they are? Because a five finger have five uh, size, right? Oh yeah. So it's really just about tracing at the speed of the breath. So even if say my middle finger is longer I'm I'm just going to trace up a little faster if my if my breath you know just oh, to keep sorry, pace with not my the, breath. The length. Yeah, so it's not even trying to regulate the length of the breath. It's simply to pay attention as we pay attention to the to to our breathing. So, Judd, I've used the five finger breathing with children, but I find adults find it just as helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, long, slow, deep breaths where we lengthen the exhales, almost double the length of the inhales. I, that's a go-to for me. I do a kind of a three, two, six, but I'm blowing it out till I can't blow any longer before I take the next inhale. Um, I, I have clients who like box breathing, the, mm -hmm. you know, breathe in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. Um, so yeah, there are lots of good breathing exercises, but would say Ollie, that if somebody is in a full blown panic attack and they are hyperventilating, I wouldn't take them to their breath. I would take them to, and I've had two full grown men come into my office, um, in full blown panic attacks. One showed up at eight in the morning with his wife. I didn't even know these people saying, you know, I didn't know where to go. I, and we just saw your office. So we're coming here to see if you can help. But we did five, four, three, two, one grounding where we, um, I had them describe in extreme detail, five things they could see, four things they could hear, three things they could feel two things they could smell, and then the taste in their mouth. The key is in the description. If you try to just say, oh, I see a, a clock and a, a vase or whatever, 
it doesn't work. You have to describe. And, and during the process of describing in detail, them out loud, the mind begins to let go because it's focused on the present. So for me, I've seen that one work um, very well with people who are in full-blown panic attacks. What about uh, any uh, coming to the body? Um, I liked, uh, Judd, how you were saying, you know, if, you know, if the anxiety that, you know, we feel in the mind, but the body is somewhere else, right? So if we, if we know what makes us be in the body somewhere else, whether it's some exercise or movement or yoga, or whatever, whatever it is, and you training that, is that anything that helps you be in this place? So when the mind is here, kind of, it's like, oh, I'm fine with you. Uh you know, I think uh, the idea of the breath, uh, the breath, uh, when you're talking about the body, so, so when we feel anxiety, the, the, it's already in the body as we're talking about the facial expression, but it's also kind of energetically in your chest and upper back, you're holding somewhere, right? So, and uh, when, you, when you say hold somewhere, when you hold, and according to these Tibetan teaching, they are held together with the air, the prana. Prana is what contracting in a particular location in the body, like in the, you're holding the heart, you're any, any organs, any part of your body. So when you do use the breath, breath needs to be coincide with awareness of where the things are in your body. So if, for example, when I'm talking about the twice longer exhalation, when you exhale, you don't just exhale the breath, but you excel breath through the area of the body because those area of the body where these toxic airs are contracted together. When I'm, when I'm breathing, I'm not just nostril breath, it's I'm breathing. Right now it's happening from my upper back, slow and deep. When in the end of exhalation, not only I feel like a, breath-wise more restful, but also I feel much more restful in my body. Mm -hmm. My body is more releasing. And I keep doing it for repeatedly for some time. The, the, the tension in my body, that area of the body is gone. So, so that already, I think, helps a lot in terms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rinpoche. Judd, did you want to go to, to that I was asking before, has that made sense to you or? I, I don't think I'd add anything more at this point, yes. Okay, okay. So, um, so about the body, I mean, it seems that clearly we can identify the anxiety in different parts of the body. And as Rinpoche was saying, we can we can bring that breath into those areas. So some traditions talk about different chakras or even just different regions of, of the body. And again, as we bring attention into those areas, we can help it kind of liberate or open, or as Rinpoche says many times, kind of connects to the spaciousness of that uh, place, of that area. And then through that, connect to the spaciousness of the whole. So is, is any of that resonate to some of the practices that, um, that uh, Judd or Anne that you do, or if you want to share any of that? Well, certainly yeah. I think that- yeah, leading a little oh, practice. Please. Now maybe after Judd, you speak, then maybe Anne can, if you uh, open to lead just uh, maybe a few minutes, uh, the, the ap ap actual practice, you know? So, so I oh. think we'll- well, I'll keep this very brief. The the noting practice, and we've adapted the RAIN acronym to where the N uh, stands for noting as compared to non-identification or nurturing or some of the others ends that folks like Tara Brock have brought forward. And so the idea is, you know, recognize that we're anxious, uh, allow that experience to be here because often we push it away. The I stands for investigation where we get curious. Oh, what does this feel like in my body? And then we just note the physical sensations and that helps us 
be able to bring in that spaciousness where we're we're less identified or at times not even identified with the the sensations and just watching them come and go. So I think that fits with being able to tap into and and meet the energy of the body and the energy of anxiety where it's at, you know, where the anxiety can be very activating. And so, you know, we can bring them in a very active pro process, whether it's noting or rain or even, you know, going for a walk and noting our experience and noting the experience around us to kind of meet the energy. So that that's all I would uh, all I would add. Thank you. And before I, I go to, there's, there's a question from the audience that it's interesting and it has to do with a different kind of anxiety, which is we're talking about breathing and breathing practices can be useful. So what happens with techniques for people that have lung disease? Have any explored that um, and that kind of little anxiety that might happen if the breath practice um, I can just say briefly that this is where people can use uh, grounding practices that are outside of the realm of the breath. So looking around or the, or the five, you know, the five, four, three, two, one experience where you're bringing in different experience of, of your, of our senses, that it doesn't have to be centered around the breath. And I, I think grounding ourselves externally, what like seeing and hearing can be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, tools in a toolbox, use the tool that works for you. <laughs> Great. And did you want to share, do you want to lead a short practice with the audience? I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to do um, a RAIN practice. And I do also use noting. So one of the things that I didn't really understand was that emotions are, you know, basically chemical downloads <laughs> in the body that are causing physical sensations. So one of the things that I use often is, you know, this is just an unpleasant physical sensation that is going to pass like they all do, right? They don't remain. So to get more grounded in the experience as just, that's all it is. It's going through. It's just another experience. Yeah. So I like the noting too, Judd, just to say that. Yeah. Okay. So inviting you all to get into a comfortable position, upright, but not rigid, eyes closed or gazing downward. And beginning with long, slow, deep breaths, getting the air all the way down to your belly and lengthening your exhales, really blowing out that tension and stress. You wanna do at least three to six of these. And inviting you now to tune into your body. Noticing if you're holding tension Relaxing forehead, softening eyes, releasing your jaw. With your next exhale, you might drop your shoulders down and back even more. Opening your chest. Letting go of tension and neck, shoulders, arms, and hands. Softening the belly. And if you're holding tension in your back, you might send a long, slow, deep breath to that area. Imagining a pillow of air, easing it, 
releasing it a bit. Relaxing pelvis, legs and feet. Inviting you to notice what emotions are present for you. Or if you want to actually use something, think about a time recently where you have been anxious. Bringing it to mind as if it's happening right now. Noticing perhaps what your mind is telling you. Don't go to a trauma, something highly anxiety provoking. Use something manageable as we train. And now letting go of those thoughts. Can you recognize the emotions that are present for you? Labeling them. Often there is a mixture of emotions. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious and fearful or sad, confused. Just notice what emotions are there. And which is the strongest of those emotions? And can you allow or accept it? It's just a feeling, chemicals in the body. Creating body sensations. And if it helps to soothe, inviting you to put a hand or both hands on your heart. Noticing that you can breathe with this. And each time your mind returns to thinking about an issue, let it go and come back to the practice. Noticing now where the anxiety is taking up residence in your guest room, your guest house of your body. It may be in your shoulders, perhaps your throat or chest feel constricted. Your stomach churning, jaw tight. Maybe your head is spinning. We can just notice these are unpleasant body sensations. It's all they are. Breathing with them. Can you notice how they shift and change?
And now bringing yourself nurturance and not identifying with this experience. Inviting your big self, your large self to say to the small self in this moment, you are as you are, perfectly imperfect, like everyone else on this planet. May you accept yourself just as you are. You could not be different. You are the perfect you and you make mistakes like everyone else. Mistakes are opportunities to learn and grow. They benefit us. You are not alone, no matter what you are experiencing. Millions of people on this planet have had the same experience today and are feeling just like you are. There are no new human stories and our stories are universal. What you're going through is hard. It would be for anyone. And you've been through challenges before. And this too shall pass. Everything does. And we can always say something to ourselves that we would say to our dearest of friends in this same situation. And now deepening the breath once again, letting go of the situation. And when you're ready, opening your eyes. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. So let me see if there's any more questions in the audience. I don't see any. Um, before we conclude, I wanted to see if uh, anyone has any other comments that you want to bring in? Uh, I'll start with Anne that is on the screen now. So, <laughs> or, and then. Well, just saying I went through that relatively quickly. If I were doing it with you in private one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be doing it a little bit slower. But um, yeah, um, these practices have been uh, a godsend for me, a gold mine. And I very much encourage you all to use the 54321, the breathing, the rain practices, and to again realize that this big self that is really within all of us is whole and um, healthy there it's there we need to connect with it thank you thank you Anne. thank you Anne. uh judd anything else that you may want to add nothing from my end just that i've really enjoyed this conversation and i hope it was beneficial for others thank you rinpoche Uh, same, you know, I think um, sitting with this quiet after this meditation. So, <laughs> so thank you, Ann and Jet, for coming and joining us. And I'm sure our audience really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I really appreciate this. It's been great to, to be with you in this dialogue.